oh, don't worry about the class in the South and all those kinds of things. So I'm not sure how I did this, but my part was I put on a uh, flash drive. You know, if I want to make any changes, I brought my flash drive here. Everything was off. All I I found this out about 8:15 this morning, which makes for a fun morning. You know, one of those things you would hear some colorful words at that moment. But so I'm a little bit discombobulated. Yes, I, was, I did save this on Google Drive. So I had it, but I lost some other stuff. But um, I'm still a little bit, uh, I don't know what happened. It's a little bit uh, out of sorts. It's just broken and it just can't. They just don't make flash drives like they used to. <laughs> yeah, fun morning. Okay, keep this out. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but. Um, this is about where we could right here, the justification and ideology. And I can't emphasize this enough, but in fact, I typed this in to make sure we got this. This would become the ideology of the South. And what was the system called when the slaves must produce a certain amount of goods? And if they do not, they're going to be tortured. Yeah, the pushing or the quota system. Yeah. And that system is shockingly effective to get people to work. I don't mean effective is good. <laughs> yeah. It's horrific. And this logic to it is just awful. This is proto-capitalism. I talked about this ideology of self justification I think we're probably where we quit, isn't this? Sound about right? Oh, what is that conflict? The name I gave you, uh, the generic name for a conflict in, in where you have a moral conflict between uh, you want to do something because it's good, but also it's immoral. Yes. Yeah, cognitive dissonance. Dissonance. Slavery's working. We like it. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be a bad person. And racism fit the bill here. And this, I think we got right to here. So let's go. Um, Do we get to any of this? Uh, I think it's right where we quit. Does this sound about right? So this is going to be the justification for slavery. The justification for civil war. The justification for establishing Jim Crow laws after the war. The justification for the lost cause myth. And this will be very pernicious. So this is racism and justifying more than just simply, it must be better, the laws favor us to something more. So first off, this concept that is civilizing, and that's all probably not invented, but since he was such a prominent politician, that's how many people knew about it, that they're civilizing the slaves. And the two points is this, these are black little children. They're just like little children. If, they, if we're not there to help them, they will just die. They won't make it. It won't work. Or they're brutal savages that will murder and rape. And in fact, rape was the one they kept emphasizing over and over again. In fact, the argument would be their fault. They can't control their emotions. So th these, yeah, they're kind of like us, but they're not quite. They, they have base emotions. They won't work unless you make them work. They won't um, abide by any kind of civilizing nature unless you make them. And you gotta make them. So that's our job. So they're arguing, we're not doing it because we're rich and greedy. It's because we're doing the work of the saints. We're making a better world. So this civilizing nature, and that's why I ask you to keep this up. So one of the great parts about this is where Calhoun lays this out, where he talks about how they're civilizing it. And he talks about, he never mentions slavery. He calls it the natural, I'm sorry, the ancient relation implying that it's always been this, this ancient relationship. Now, yes, there has been slavery, but not the way it happened in the colonies and then in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere then it spread everywhere. It's more like, more like indentured servitude. But if you look down at that fourth paragraph, someone look down at that fourth paragraph, it's a wonderful bit of Calhoun giving you evidence of the civilizing nature of this. 
evidence of this. The number of deaf, dumb, blind, idiots, and saints, as it's <laughs> and insane, of the Negroes in the states that have changed the Asian relation. By the way, before we get to that, okay, down. What does that do with slavery? What's dumb? I can't speak. Moot. Moot. You're moot. Mute. <laughs> blind? How do you define an idiot? How do you calculate the number of idiots in society? Is there a formula to calculate idiots? What do you designate as an idiot? How do you designate someone as insane? Is there a mathematical formula? You check off these four boxes, you're insane. So, the number of these deaf, dumb, blind, idiots, and insane of the Negroes in the States that have changed the ancient relation between the races is one out of every 96. So every place that got rid of slavery, one out of 96 is an idiot. Well, in states adhering to it, so states keeping the natural order. This is an important element, keeping the natural order is one out of 672. So there are fewer deaf, dumb, blind, insane idiots in areas that have slavery than don't have slavery. Where did Calhoun get these numbers? I don't think so. I think it's something out of the Bible. I don't know, it could be anywhere. You pull them out. Yeah, these are just made up. But this is an important thing. If you want to believe that slavery is good, that it's benefiting you. What does this do? Say it again. Yeah, it's not so bad. We're helping them. And the term is a great term. It's called confirmation. You ever heard of that? Confirmation bias. You want to believe something. This confirms what you want to believe, doesn't it? I want to believe it. It fits in. And there's going to be a lot of confirmation bonds. Is it true? That doesn't matter. If you want to believe it, then it's true. And here's the thing about an ideology. An ideology is a strongly held belief. It is something you believe to be true. And if you believe something is true, then it's true to you. Then it's true to you. And facts don't matter. All that matters is you believe it. Ideologies can be really scary. This is what people go to horrific wars about. Ideology. And we all have them. Every one of us. But here's this ideology. We are civilizing them. And we have facts right here. Proof. And this wonderful document. Actually, I'll come back to this one. So, then the next part about it. It's natural. That's why I called it the ancient relationship. It's natural. In fact, it's even in the Bible. Since the, the dominant religion among citizens of the United States at that time was Christianity, it's in the Bible. Heck, it's in the Gospels. How to treat slaves right. It must be okay. So that would all be used to justification. But here's the thing about it. I didn't type this in, but please get this down and at least think about it. This is why it's natural, therefore, to change it would be against nature. To change it would be against the established way. Something about to change it would destroy the established order. You're messing things up. If you're changing, you're creating a system that might lead to chaos. If you change this, you can't change this. And then lastly, it works. There's economic growth. It's profitable. If it didn't work, we wouldn't be rich. Now, of course, the money is focusing to a tiny, narrow group. Most people will never get the wealth that is uh, being just sucked out of these slaves. But the idea was, well, we're all getting rich. 
if we weren't or we didn't have economic growth, it must not work. And therefore, it all works. It's all working well. Now, this diagram, I'll show you one more picture. I just found the full plate. That's what they call illustrations in books. And I know you've seen books like this where they have all the illustrations in one set of sections. The older printing styles, it was much cheaper to put all the prints, the pictures in one section. So I found the whole print of this. So if it's type of mankind, and this is a sciency book. When I mean sciency, it looks like science. And especially in an era where this was all literally brand new, this was great confirmation bias. Wow, look at this. The skulls of a Caucasian are significantly different than a cop skull of, it says right here, a Negro. So someone of African descent. And it says the skull right here must be closer to a skull of a chimpanzee. That's supposed to be a chimpanzee. And by the way, is that what the skulls look like? No. But most people don't know that, especially then. And remember, all they got to do, let's see, show that. See? You got the diagram right here. Must be true. How can you argue against nature? How can you do that? And so here it's comparing an orangutan. And I'll explain what a coffee is a little bit later. And so on down the road, where it tries to designate that there are differences in races. By the way, this always makes me laugh. You might know what that is. Hmm? Yeah, that's David. That's Michelangelo's David in Florence. And so the white person they wanted to put there was a statue, which just kind of makes me laugh. And the other thing about it is, is the statue's huge. And so the idea is you're standing up, looking up at it. So to make it look proportional, the head is abnormally large. So we have this freaky statue head here. I just found that amusing, but they didn't realize it. They don't care. This is science. We'll come back more to, the, more to this, but this is the roots of something that will become probably the most dominant philosophy in the world at the end of the century, called social Darwinism. It's coming. But that's where we get this positive good theory. This would be the crowning achievement of Southern ideological thought, political thought. When I mean crowning achievement, I'm not saying it's a good thing. Because its roots and tentacles get to this very day. But natural. In fact, I know I wrote that down. Okay, if you look at the documents I gave you, let's add one more document I want you to very quickly read. So if you look down, you find the positive good theory. So it's one paragraph. We're going to read it right now in class. But before you read it, what do you got to think about? Before you ever read it, what do you got to think about? And historical context, read, you know, read about, think about who the author is. We know a lot about that fact. So we should be thinking of text. We just talked about it. Because this is 1846. It's two years out. But make sure you think about that. Think about what's going on. Now, quick read the document and think about what he wants you to believe about this. It's absolutely a remarkable bit. He's expanding on that pack of that letter. Got a couple minutes. Go. Think about the purpose really quick. What is he trying to get from this? Just one second.
The other fun thing is my computer doesn't have a DVD player anymore. I got a new computer and no DVD player. Don't you feel sorry for me? Don't you feel my pain today? I can tell from your eyes you're just going, shut up. Hey, at least we're back in school. So, what is he trying to say? First off, yeah. So it's always going to be a bother of which class is he in. Yeah. So he's writing, there's always going to be this. And so that was the first thing I typed here. So there's always going to be someone on top. And everyone else is going to labor for them. And that those on top, going to be small. It's always been that way. In the feudal system, you have kings and the serfs. The patricians and the plebeians in ancient Rome. So always one group on top, one group on the bottom. Always. And then what? OK, if there's always going to be one group. That means that system in the south, one group on top, one group on the bottom. In the north, or he doesn't say the north. In this document, he uses someone to substitute for the north, north so he's not really acting like he's criticizing the north. Who does he say? Europe, yeah. England, Europe. That's what he's saying. He's substituting somebody else. So, what about the labor? Who treats their labor better? Yeah, how do you, does he give you proof? <laughs> the kind care. When do they care for the slaves? The master and mistress, when do they care? Cradle to grave. When they're born, the master and mistress is there to care for them. If they're too sick to work, who's there to care for them? The master and the mistress. If they're too old to work, who's there? The master. They're there to care for them. What a great system, huh? Think about it. You have no needs then. All you need to do is we'll do a little bit of work, but then they'll care for you. What a great, I mean, doesn't that slavery sound pretty good? You're sick, there's somebody there to care for you? By the way, is that the truth? Of course not. But that's what they said. But what happens to the poor in the, in the, in the more civilized parts of Europe, a.k.a. the North? If workers can't work, what happens to them? Where do they go? If there's no job for them, if they're injured on the job, what happens to them? Say it again. Now they say home, but then what happens to their money? What happens to them? Yeah, they, they, they don't have any food, they can't care for their family, they go to the poorhouse, which are absolute hellholes. And who cares for them? Nothing. They're sent there to die. Wow, that slavery sounds pretty good. There's fewer deaf, dumb, blinding idiots, and they care for you from cradle to grave. In fact, what they said is, we treat our labor better. The North, they're nothing but wage slaves. So this cartoon shows it right here. Look at the slavery as it exists in America. And here they are dancing and playing and having a blast. I mean, look how much fun they got a banjo. And this is slavery as it exists in England, but everyone knows what they mean. And here is the, um, the cloth factory shut down impoverished people starving, the wealthy uh, capitalists turning down someone for a job. That's the system they have there. What a great system in the North. That leads to nothing but pain and suffering. But in the South, they care. Why would you want to spread that system to the rest of the territories? This sounds pretty good. In fact, here we have the master and the mistress. Here are slaves. Poor things, they can't take care of themselves. But we'll do it. Oh, wow. But here's the other thing, and this is actually really crucial. Labor, happy, what color is skin? Workers, treated horribly, what color is their skin? What color is your skin here? Northern wage slaves, according to this theory, they're white. 
They're treating white people like that. That's what they're doing in the North. This is part of the positive good theory. They're not supposed to treat white people like that. Why is that supposed to be treated like that? It's supposed to be somebody else. You treat white people like slaves, and eventually, what will they do? They'll have enough. What will they do? And so what this is saying is, this system will avoid rebellion. You can't treat white workers, but in the South, we have a natural order. There won't be civil war. There won't be rebellion. The northern system is actually more dangerous. The northern system will lead to civil war. That's why we need to spread slavery to the territories. Slavery is good, and they like it. Did he believe this? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you necessarily believe or not believe. What matters is what you do with your power and your public persona. He was a powerful person, and this is what he pushed. So he's using this. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. That isn't important. And so with that, this is where we get the growing political ideology of the South. It's beyond now just justification for slavery. It's the politics of the South. And it's wrapped around this positive good theory of slavery. Slavery is good. Slavery is positive. And we got to expand it to the territories. It's more than just, we want to make sure we have enough senators to protect our way of life. It's, we want the better system. I guess maybe if they want to sleep at night, you can make yourself believe it. People are very delusional if they want to. We've got to spread this. But then what of the North? Oops, where are we at here? In the North, I don't know why I capitalized rabbit, but I wanted to. Northerners, they're all in reality a bunch of rabbit abolitionists who want to get rid of slavery, get rid of our system, call us evil, and create slave rebellions. And they started saying more and more there's just nothing but conspiracies against us all over the North. Conspiracies. Criminal cabals trying to come, over, come and take us over. Here is a, a uh, or here is a, uh, a poster. It's outright fellow citizens and abolitionists of the, of the most revolting character is among you exciting the feelings of the North against the South. A seditious, which is by definition speaking out against the government. Lecture is to be delivered this evening trying to tell people to come out and protest, trying to shut them up. Using a mob to try to censor abolitionists. The Union Forever. They believe there's all these conspiracies. And here's the thing. They started, started to believe more and more, even Northerners who said they weren't against slavery, or at least slavery in the States, are lying. They're lying. They're hiding something. They really want to make slavery, or they really want to destroy their way of life. They're willing to destroy the country to destroy slavery. And they don't want to get rid of slavery just because they think, or because they think slavery is immoral. They want to destroy slavery because they hate the South. They just hate us. They just hate us. And conspiracies run rampant. And this is a scary thing. Where you might have half the country, or not half. The South was a lot less. South was about a third of the population by 1860. Who live in a different reality. They live in a totally different reality. And if you believe something to be true, if you believe it, and somebody tries to tell you opposite, you know you're right. What do you think about that person? If they try to convince you that you're wrong, what do you think about them? Yeah, they're, some, they're evil, they're bad. And they're what? They're exactly. And you all are, I forget. <laughs> Conspiracies run rampant. You see this in any time of a lot of stress in society. I mean, you see it now. Conspiracies just run rapid. We just know they're, they must be tell, not telling the truth. And with that, the South helped them to siege. Which is amazing because so many Northerners, with very good reason, 
are saying to the South, we're trying to bully them. And to the South, they're like, we have no choice because they hate us and want to kill us. By the way, it's hard to reason with somebody. It's hard to reason with somebody who believes. Hard to believe somebody who believes that you are trying to kill them. Hard to have a reasonable conversation. Hey, let's talk. No, I won't. don't want to talk because you're trying to kill me. Probably not a good starting point. So with that, we're going to jump right to here. What we're coming to is the gone with the wind myth of the South. And this is the Southern society where slaves like slavery, the old plantation home, always got to have a steamboat. Here you have just picking the cotton. Look at you just loafing, having a good time. Probably have to get them to work. You know how they are. Here, it's uh, the master and mistress. And you know how they are. So caring and loving. Here's another one of this idealized South. A lot of these lithographs. This is from the 1850s. See the plantation home. Look at this slave quarters. That's pretty nice. Curtains. Pretty sweet, huh? Singing and dancing. Do they ever work? Well, a little bit. Just having a blast. This idealized South. And slavery in practice, though, might have been a little bit different than this. Or if you go to Mount Vernon, you can buy this little book for kids. A birthday cake for George Washington, having the slaves make birthday cake for him. And it's just how much fun it is to make a birthday cake. And for little kids, I'm talking about life on the plantation. Yeah, still buy it. And it's shocking, but it's this gone with the wind myth. But as I mentioned, I mentioned last week, I know it's weird online. By the way, I did appreciate so many students have their cameras on with various animals in it. I really enjoyed that immensely. And there are a couple of people in my class have squirrels as pets. I'm very impressed. So, I wouldn't mind a squirrel. I know they're just rats with fluffy tails, but still. No, I said I had a professor at college. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what class it was, but he's talking about slavery and said slavery, they treated the slaves really well. Slaves were treated well because they were so valuable. They would never mistreat slaves. All this talk about slavery being bad, it's just not true. Oh, sure, there's some problems with it. <laughs> we're like, wow. But I'm sure there are a lot of people, no, no. Okay, I guess. Sounds about right. In practice, the reality, hell on earth. A hovel built by the slave, their clothes made, homes, homespun. Generally, one or two sets of clothes a year for every slave that they would make themselves. That's homespun. Very crude, so basically, you know, cold, cold in the winter, hot in the summer. Wood floors crammed into these awful quarters. This is a sod one in Texas. You know what sod buildings are? Yeah, stacked up grass, yeah. But all kinds of fun animals live in there and drop on you. And, okay, I love this picture though. This is actually right after the Civil War, but it's slave quarters. And I love how they have the dog here. If you look at the picture of the dog, you notice how skinny this thing looks? It's a black spot there, but it makes it look like it has like no belly at all. Hey, it's a dog gets to see it. I like that. So, but the basic diet, some kind of corn or wheat porridge, maybe a little bit of, of kind of a biscuity bread or a, a whole bread, it was called, wrap around a stick, but um, occasionally beans, but you know, it's almost no protein. So it must have just been constantly hungry. They all had parasites, all had one. One out of, or only 4% of slaves lived to the age of 60. Um, most stopped before the age of four. And just, I mean, we can go on about how miserable that life is, and that's only just part of it. The whole system operates under terror and coercion. And that's why I put down quota. If you don't, with the question mark, don't make the quota, what's gonna happen to you? The whole system just totally revolves around this. And there'll be this whole myth that will develop. In fact, it developed at that time that they're good slaveholders. They didn't use the lash that much. No, they did all the time. In fact, you see this right here? Stocks will be used all the time. 
So you wouldn't beat them, you put them in a stock. Go on that stock for a while, and let me tell you how comfortable you are after about 30 seconds. It is unreal how uncomfortable it was. So I was in this one place, a place called Stone the Wall in England, and as it, they have a little stock out in the city square. You know, they, that'd be the punishment for doing things like spitting on the street or something. And I got on the stock like that, just, you know, one thing you said, they just have for, for the tourists. And I was in it for like a minute, and I thought my leg was going to fall off. It hurt so bad. And then how could it, I was just kind of sitting with, at a weird angle, and next thing you know, just sharp pain was shooting down my hip. I couldn't even imagine that for any period of time. It totally blew me away. And I'm the toughest person I know standing here. It hurt so bad. So you could do, you don't use the lash, it's still torture. There's no such thing as slavery without terror and torture. It doesn't exist. You have to have a whole apparatus of slave codes, militia, and the ability to torture slaves at will to have slavery. If you don't have that, you don't have slavery. In fact, I was just talking about this in... Um, in Western Civ, we're talking about the Roman Empire fell and collapsed in Western Europe, but there was no slavery in Western Europe. You know, the whole Roman system revolved around slavery. And I've seen, in fact, the textbook says it's partially because of the development of Christianity, which of course is not true, because Romans were Christian for 200 years, they had slaves. You know what happened? The state fell apart and they didn't have the whole apparatus to keep slaves, like slave codes and all those kind of things. Away. You got to have this whole apparatus of terror and coercion. By the way, if you keep an entire society based upon beating, when they rebel, you see why it's going to be so bloody? They know what's going to happen to them if they rebel and they're caught. This is nothing about what's going to happen. So there's no prisoners taken. And here's more of the lash. You know, the paddle, the lash. Here is another torture. Um, this is um, being showered to death, slowly drowned. This was actually pretty common punishment. This is one of the most famous pictures of this era. Have you ever seen this picture before? It's in the textbook, too. But I can't remember if it's in this chapter or in the Civil War chapter. So in 1862, the Union took New Orleans, took New Orleans in the southern part of Louisiana. And when they opened up the Union Army, which would be decisive for the victory of the United States, but opened it up to, to former slaves, all these slaves came. In 1863, a doctor was doing the cursory test of soldiers. By the way, it was basically, you have kind of, you kind of have teeth. Let's go. You know, that was about it. But this man came in and volunteered. This is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And the doctor was so taken by his back, he took a picture of it. This is a Union soldier off of the United States. And that's his back. And almost certainly, probably, he refused to do his quota. He fought back in the only way he could. If all, are, if all I am is a beast of burden, you're not going to get my work. Go to hell. So that's one brave, tough human being. That would kill most people, that number of lashes. Here's some more of the instruments of terror. Anybody seen that before? Chained around his neck, bolted there, he ran away. That's a torture for him trying to run, they caught him, put that on. Can you run away like that? And the other thing is, can you imagine how much of that hurt? That'd be iron. And that had to weigh 20 pounds. Think how bad that would hurt. How much that would hurt your neck. That's on 24 hours a day. She ran away, they put this thing with bells on her head. See that? More apparatus, they have to be wrapped around your ankle. Bolt it in so you can't get out. Think about trying to run. Oh, you still have to do your work and meet your quota. But they make you wear that. Same thing with this, around your ankles. Can't run away, still gotta do your job. So, coercion, terror. And so, on the slide, on this, another kind of pernicious, Stop right there. Those are my reading This one always, they always give me the, you know, it's easy to, uh, 
one of the first things we all do it as humans, think, think about uh, putting ourselves in that position. These ones just terrify. The whole idea. So I did assign 2481 to 501 to the rest of chapter. What chapter is it? 11? The chapter about slavery. <laughs> One of the things is I've been doing this for so many years, and I've gone through uh, six versions of this textbook, and they always change the chapters. I have no idea what chapter we're on now. They always change the textbook so it forces you to buy a new one. That's what we call an old doppel. So we'll finish this up tomorrow. Oh, don't forget, I gave you that little quiz. Most people are doing really well on it, but. Make sure you finish it up. There's 14 questions. Okay, shut the camera off. I've got so many things to do.